Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Ben Barkas, Editorial Director for Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is entitled Optimized QNPA Expression Analysis Yields Biological Insight in Lung Cancer FFPE. The sponsor of this webinar is HTG Molecular Diagnostics. Our presenters today are Kenneth Hoffman, Senior Research Scientist at the Hammond Center for Therapeutic Oncology Research at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, and John Lucky, Senior Director of Strategic Marketing at HTG Molecular Diagnostics. A reminder to attendees, you may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which usually appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box in the upper right side of the control panel. When you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask the panelists questions after their presentations. We'll now begin the webinar with Kenneth Huffman of UT Southwestern Medical Center. Please go ahead, Kenneth. Thank you, Ben. Um, so as everyone, as he mentioned, uh, I'm a senior research scientist in uh, Dr. John Minna's lab at UT Southwestern, and we specialize in lung cancer research. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about some work we've done in lung cancer uh, FFPE tumor normal tissue samples uh, investigating nuclear receptors. So uh, anybody who's involved in lung cancer research has probably seen uh, the most recent version of Hannah Hannon and Weinberg's Hallmarks of Cancer. And I, uh, I show you this today for, for one reason, and that's just to, to show you the, the, the different things that cancers do uh, in order to proliferate. And on the next page, uh, these are the 48 nuclear receptors that we're investigating and all of the different things that nuclear receptors uh, do. And although nuclear receptors are well known in, in, in breast cancer and prostate cancer, um, their roles in lung cancer are relatively unstudied. And so um, in some work that I'll discuss in a little bit more detail in a second, we've made the observation that profiling nuclear receptors uh, in lung cancer patients has uh, the ability to identify clinically distinct groups. And so we uh, submitted a grant to CPRIT, the Cancer uh, Prevention Research Institute of Texas, to explore the possibility that nuclear uh, receptor expression profiles can be prognostic, diagnostic, and the potential for nuclear receptors to be uh, drug targets as well. So as I mentioned, um, this uh, CPRIT grant uh, was funded. A uh, part of it involves a collaboration with HTG Molecular Diagnostics in Tucson. And the idea is to further develop the quantitative, quantitative nuclease protection assay that they're uh, expert in as a uh, detection platform that was amenable to all different uh, types of cancer samples. Uh, in particular, the ones that we were most interested in are formal and fixed paraffin embedded and core needle biopsies. Now, although we've done most of our work in lung cancer, I will show you a little bit of data that we've collected in breast cancer as well as part of this, this uh, collaborative grant. And so the primary goal of, uh, of our collaboration with HTG was to define nuclear receptors and co-regulator expression profiles in lung cancer using the 48 members of the NR family and 72 chosen members of the co-regulator family. And so just as a sort of a, a broad review, these, there are six families of nuclear receptors in our, actually seven, uh, NR1 through six and then an NR0 family. Um, there are several different classes of families. Um, some we're very familiar with, estrogen receptor, uh, progesterone receptor, antigen receptor, glucocorticoid receptor, and then some that are not so familiar. But most nuclear receptors are organized in a fairly predictable way uh, with a, uh, an N-terminal domain, a DNA binding domain. These are transcription factors, uh, a flexible region, and then a ligand binding domain. And the thing that makes tr uh, nuclear receptors particularly attractive in cancer research is the fact that they are essentially ligand-activated transcription factors. And in fact, about 15% of all FDA drugs are targeted to nuclear receptors. 
the co-regulators, there are more than 300 of them, actually I think there are 400 now, and they predominantly function as transcriptional activators or repressors, hence their name. But they do have a lot of other roles. Um, their structures are heterogeneous, uh, as well as their functions, and more importantly, they exhibit very tissue-specific activity. Uh, a number of co-regulators, uh, such as SRC3, which uh, may be better known by its, its name, Amplified in Breast Cancer 1 or AIB1, uh, have oncogenic activity, while other uh, co-regulators that we're going to study uh, serve tumor suppressive functions, uh, a gene uh, like RB1. And the 72 co-regulators that we did choose for this project were based on their interactions with nuclear receptors and their roles in cancer biology. So. Now, just as uh, kind of a quick reminder, um, I'm showing you uh, two modes of transcriptional activation that nuclear receptors can uh, achieve. The first are the steroid hormone receptors, where you have a, a, some sort of uh, ligand. Usually it's uh, lipophilic. It can cross membranes. And it binds to the receptor. And through interactions with, with other co-regulators can either activate transcription or repress transcription. And usually these are done, uh, the steroid receptors as homodimers. Um, the other type two receptors uh, usually interact as heterodimers with RXR. And they're also ligand activated. And again, you can achieve uh, activation or repression of a gene depending on the ligand and the co-regulators that are, that are bound. So this is uh, some data that we've published in a couple of papers, one in PLOS medicine and one in molecular endocrinology in 2012. Um, so the first bit of data I'm going to show you is that nuclear receptor expression is able, to, is able to properly subdivide lung cancer cell lines uh, based on their general histotype. So we have on the far left in green normal immortal cells. Uh, these are HBECs or human bronchial epithelial cells. In the middle, the blue uh, the blue cell lines are just non-small cell lung cancers, a mix of adeno and squamous. And then the red are the small cell lung cancers. So as you can see in an unbiased cluster, uh, I'm not showing the genes of the heat maps, but essentially they're able to, nuclear receptors by themselves are able to segregate the histotypes. On the right, um, we're showing you that nuclear receptors are expressed specifically in certain types of lung cancer. So for instance, in small cell, you see the short hairpin uh, sorry, uh, SHP is able to, uh, SHP is expressed in small cell lung cancer and not in non-small cell. However, PPAR gamma, a very familiar receptor, is expressed in non-small cell and not in small cell of the HBECs. And then the last panel down at the bottom left is, uh, is a, a, a piece of uh, data that we published in the 2010 paper where we're showing that the expression of certain nuclear receptors is prognostic. Uh, in large data sets. So that's essentially the, the genesis of, of the work that I'm going to show you today. So um, there's not much argument about this, but cancer tissue, there's so much of it worldwide that in order to learn more about expression, uh, what things are important in lung cancer in particular, um, we need to be able to assay FFPE. Uh, FFPE is difficult to assay by RNA-seq RNA or PCR just because of the nature of formalin. Uh, so HTG, uh, our collaboration, began with the fact that they have a simple high-throughput assay that appears to be well-suited for FFPE. Um, there's tens of millions of these archived samples worldwide, and paraffin embedding is still essentially a standard protocol in the surgical suite. So I'm just going to give a quick description of some of the sample sets we're going to talk about today. Uh, the MD Anderson or Prospect data set is, is essentially our primary test set. And this is uh, comprised of 272 cases, uh, FFPE, tumor normal matched, with full clinical annotation. Um, I'll also show some data from our, uh, our human lung cancer cell line database uh, from the MENA lab. And then uh, just briefly touch on some breast cancer samples, 120 ER positive, ER negative, and HER2 positive FFPE samples from our collaborator Baylor, Dr. Suzanne Fuqua. And then we're going to be comparing the data sets, uh, the QNPA data sets, to various other data sets that we have and that are available. Um, specifically, we're looking at microarray, RNA-seq, and qPCR from our own lung cancer cell lines as a comparator. And then meta-analysis of various platforms of RNA expression in the UT Southwestern Lung Cancer Database. 
Uh, we're going to look at the TCGA lung cancer database, and then another database that we don't hear talked about much, but it was something involved. Uh, the NCI had a project called the EDRN, Early Detection Research Network, in which they had 83 tumor normal match pairs from early stage lung cancer patients. So we'll take a look at that as well. So the idea was to establish and try to meet criteria for not only using this at the bench, but to move it into the clinic as well. So in the, the first and one of the more important things that, that we wanted to do was to look at endogenous controls to assess sample quality because FFP, not all FFPE blocks are well preserved or, or were well fixed or they're just in various states of what you would consider good or bad. Um, to figure out how much of the FFPE uh, tissue we would need, quantitative analysis, and then various archival comparisons. Uh, the assay must be CLIA certifiable, and the HTG group will probably tell you more about that. And then for us, uh, we've always considered qPCR and RNA-seq as a gold standard, and we want to know how those compared. And then for validation, we wanted to, to try and understand some important biological uh, aspects of, of lung cancer, uh, being, able to, being able to do that using QNPA. So the sample prep for QNPA at, uh, at, at the bench, at least in our case, is very simple. Um, the, all of the samples we're going to show you now from the prospect data, data set uh, were macro dissected uh, based on H&E slides. The tissue is scraped into a tube. Uh, lysis buffer is added, it's heated, and then the assay is run. Uh, frozen tissue and cell pellets are, are even more simple to assay. You simply collect the tissue or the pellet, add the lysis buffer heat, and run the assay. So the very first thing we wanted to do was to look at controls. And so we chose, I won't go into details about where this started, but we essentially chose 400 genes from various data sets and boiled that list down to 92 endogenous control genes and created two, uh, two plates, an endogenous control one and two, 92 genes total. And we assayed 102 cell lines, 673 uh, FFPE tissues, tumor normal, and then uh, another 670 FFPE from breast cancer. And we assayed uh, those samples for those 92 genes. And then on the right, I'm showing you two cell lines. Um, one is a tumor line, HCC4017, this is lung cancer, and then it's match normal immortalized uh, line, HBEC 30 kt And we assayed those uh, both as fresh frozen and as FFPE embedded cell pellets, and then ran the 92 endogenous control gene array. And as you can see, the correlation is, is very, very good. So QNPA is uh, behaving as well in FFPE as it is with a, with a frozen sample. And so we assay, after assaying all those different samples and cell lines, we essentially set up a, a set of criteria. And we considered four things. One, the range of expression. Two, a low coefficient of variation. So essentially the variation across the 800 and I believe 900 samples that we ran. Uh, the number of times that that gene failed in the assay. And then as a final sort of uh, a, so more of a subjective consideration. Uh, a lot of the genes that perform really well are, are ribosomal proteins, and they are very highly expressed. But we wanted to try to balance those choices by not having all ribosomal proteins. So for instance, CTBP1 is a lower expressor. Uh, it did have a few more fails, and its coefficient of variation is a little larger, but that's because it's a more low expressed gene. So. Those are the considerations we made in choosing the five genes that we chose. Now, the one thing that was important to us is using these genes to identify low-quality FFPE samples, which obviously would be a problem. As you can see, I pointed out three samples here that failed all five uh, endogenous controls. So those are samples that would essentially be compromised in, in a test data set. So we, we use this array not only to normalize our test data, but also to throw out samples that aren't going to pass. And so this is the entire data set. This is 1,174 samples run by QNPA, and the graphic below the heat map shows you the, the breakdown of the samples. And so the one thing um, I wanted to, to show you with this is that 
the 72 co-regulators and 48 nuclear receptors are able to segregate uh, tumor from normal and able to segregate the three different subtypes of breast cancer and uh, also segregates the cell lines uh, at, by tumor and normal as well. So all these samples are run in, tick, in triplicate and normalized using our EC genes. And so this is another set of comparisons. What we're looking at here is cell lines uh, on various platforms, microarray, RNA-seq, or qPCR, and comparing them to qNPA data. And so on the left, we're showing microarray. This is Illumina microarray versus qNPA for the 120 nuclear receptors and co-regulators. And so the y-axis is the microarray, the x is qNPA. And I'm showing you one exemplar cell line, H2009. And this is um, this was done with 64 cell lines with the microarray, and the average Pearson correlation is 0.66, which for cross-platform analyses is, is, is fairly good. Um, we also have a comparison for RNA-seq. Uh, this is 97 cell lines. Again, we show you one exemplar cell line there. And for the 97 cell lines, the average correlation is 0.77. And then on the far right, we're showing qPCR versus uh, qNPA. And we only had data for the 40, for 41 of our nuclear receptors on a large panel. And so for 31 comparators, comparing PCR to QNPA, we get a Pearson of 0.71. So QNPA is performing uh, very well in comparison to other uh, RNA expression platforms. So just to summarize the first part, um, we've, we've developed the endogenous control program and found a set of consistently performing genes, which will help us identify four samples and normalize test data. Um, some data I didn't talk about, but we put a fair bit of work into is the sample input normalization. And we've determined that actually about one-fourth of a 10 micron section uh, of, for FFPE is suitable for getting consistent expression in triplicate with QNPA, and that's important. Um, we've correlated the EC panel expression for uh, a cell pellet embedded in FFPE versus fresh frozen, and the Pearson uh, correlation is very good. Um, unbiased clustering of uh, the NR coreg expression data from QNPA does properly segregate the samples, as you might predict. And um, all of the expression data that we, that we have for various lung and breast cancer cell lines on the various platforms compare very well to QNPA. So we were very pleased to see all the data uh, turn out as nicely as it did. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the biology that we've been investigating that came out of the, uh, the QNPA in our CoReg uh, expression data set. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I'm showing you here are uh, 232 uh, tumor, 235 match normal um, from the prospect data set. And you can see the heat map up above, so the, the NRs and CoRegs are able to segregate the tumor from normal in, in a fairly predictable way. The one interesting thing that, that we discovered is, and that this was sort of counterintuitive for us, a number of the nuclear receptors were expressed lower in the tumor than they were in the normal. And we sort of just expected, well, they're transcription factors and they should be expressed more highly in, in proliferative tissue. But that was actually not the case. So in order to, to look at this a little bit further, uh, we used our lung cancer database here at UT Southwestern. So our statistical group has essentially curated 20 literature data sets where you have uh, survival and you have tumor normal data. And we wanted to compare what we noticed in HTG to these other data sets. And so I'm showing you here a heat map of the 48 NRs and, and uh, sorry, 72 co-regs. And what you can see is that the expression pattern for the NRs, you see a lot of green on the left side of uh, that part of the heat map. And that's showing you that across all of these data sets, we're seeing a significant, significant downregulation of nuclear receptor expression. And the HTG data set fits right in with that. So we did some meta-analysis to look at the receptors that were downregulated in the HTG data set versus receptors that were downregulated in the meta-analysis from the previous heat map. And so what we're showing you here is just a list of 
the nuclear receptors that were downregulated and uh, the comparison of those to the, to the 20 metadata set. And what you can see is that 18 of these nuclear receptors are downregulated both in the HTG and the meta analysis. So it appears that all the data sets that we've analyzed are showing essentially the same thing that nuclear receptors are, appear to be systematically downregulated. And with the co-regulator group, there's also a number of those that are downregulated as well, although there's, just as a group, there's not as many. So one of the questions that came up in the process of analyzing this is, well, you know, are nuclear receptors as a transcription factor family unique? Or is this some sort of feature that a number of the transcription factor families have. And so what we find is that um, of the 13 fairly well-established transcription factor families here, the nuclear receptors are fairly unique. The beta zip in the ETS family also shows some significant downregulation, but in comparison to all, nuclear, uh, all transcription factors, NRs are indeed unique. 21 of the receptors were down versus 27 not down, so almost half of the nuclear receptors are downregulated amongst the non-NR transcription factors, the percentage is much, much lower. So this appears to be a nuclear receptor specific uh, issue. So the next question we wanted to ask was, well, if we're downregulating nuclear receptors, since they are transcription factors, would their target genes also be expressed at, at lower level? And so we only had cystrome data for the glucocorticoid receptor in lung cancer, there's cystrome data for other tissue types, but we wanted to, to keep the analysis within lung cancer. And so when you look at GR target genes based on cystrome analysis, um, and then you look at the metadata set that we had, obviously we, don't, we, don't, we only have 120 genes for the QNPA, but if you look at the expression data for these other data sets, you can see pretty clearly that GR is downregulated, and so are a number of its target genes, suggesting that you know this feature does have a transcriptional outcome. So if you downregulate the receptor, you're also downregulating the output of that receptor. Now, this is something uh, I, I mentioned in the when I was describing the data sets to you. So this is what, what uh, what's known as the EDRN Canary data set, or the Early Detection Research Network. And this was an NCI initiative where they were looking at essentially early detection biomarkers. And so what we've done is we've we've taken this data set uh, and we've analyzed it because it has a tumor versus normal comparison. That's clearly what we're what we're most interested in. And what we see, and so over on the left. Uh, you see that the majority of the patients in the study, there were 83 total, are strongly biased towards stage one and stage two. And so we looked at receptor expression over here on the right, and what we see is these sets of receptors here are boxed off on the right, PPAR gamma, uh, the NR4 family, uh, thyroid receptor GR, ROR alpha. These receptors are downregulated even, even in these early stage samples. And you can see down in the volcano plot and the co-regulators, you don't see the strong skew towards this downregulation. And so we noted downregulation in, these, in, these, uh, in the HTG data set and also in this, this big meta data set analysis. And now we see this downregulation. Uh, it's not as strong as we've seen in the other data sets, but that might be because this is a uh, a progressive event. So nuclear receptors, as cancer progresses in lung cancer, the hypothesis would be that the lung cancer would downregulate them as they go. But we see evidence of this downregulation in these in, in uh, these these early stage samples. So one thing, um, one data set we had access to was uh, looking at the methylation uh, in the TCGA data set. And so we took the downregulated receptors and co-regulators, and we looked at uh, 50 tumor normal match pairs in TCGA, and this is uh, principal component analysis. And the the the, the specifics I, I would would be unable to describe to you in great detail. But the the basic uh, result that was interesting, and what we're looking at here is whole gene methylation. So not just in the promoter or upstream of the transcriptional start sites. We're looking at the whole gene, and the reason we do that is because methylation patterns with nuclear receptors in particular. 
uh, have shown uh, it's it's been shown that uh, methylation within some of the introns and uh, downstream of the transcriptional start site are considered to be very important in, in the regulation of, of that of uh, nuclear receptor. So we looked at whole gene, and what we see here, both coregs and in ours, is that the normals cluster very tightly, as you might expect, but the methylation patterns for the tumors um, get very skewed and, and are very, very different. So uh, we're going to start thinking about some validation experiments to look at methylation and you know, whether or not those are important in the controls of NR, but this is an observation that, that we made. So when we look at the meta-analysis uh, of all these different data sets that have, now we're looking at clinical data, the overarching conclusion is that the more nuclear receptors are expressed, the higher that they're expressed, the better the patient seems to do. And so on the left, this is just meta-analysis of the lung cancer database at UT Southwestern, and we're just showing you one example here of NR3C1. But you can see that the majority of the survival analysis is skewed to the left of that line, which suggests that lower expression is worse for the patient. So we went to uh, another online resource, it's called CAMPlotter, and we looked at our nuclear receptors and our co-regulators. And what we see here, again, is the same thing. The nuclear receptors that are strongly downregulated in the HTG data set, um, the majority of them show um, uh, that the, the, more, the more highly they're expressed, the better the patient does. So again, it appears that, at least in the lung cancer context, that the tumors would prefer to have these nuclear receptors downregulated. So this is so now we're looking at survival analysis in the prospect data set. So this is where we collected, you know, th this is the the data set we did the QNPA with, and the multi-gene classifier we used is uh, shown up there on the left. And this is nine nuclear receptors that are the most downregulated. Uh, we're also downregulated in the meta-analysis and are downregulated most significantly, meaning their their expression is is lower in tumors, significantly lower than in the normal. So when we look at the survival in all stages, um, we see that it's not terribly predictive. And up here, at the, up here in the right, I'm showing you that, again, the prospect data set is pretty heavily skewed towards early stage patients. And so the, the patient population may not be progressed enough to show a bigger difference. But when we pull out stage three and stage four, we see very clearly that the higher, the, the, the higher expression you have of these nuclear receptors, the better the patient does. So one other thing that we were interested in is looking at the various lung cancer mutations and their association with these nuclear receptors. So KRAS, all these other very familiar lung cancer mutations, uh, they essentially had no correlation to any nuclear receptor or co-regulator. But one uh, particular mutation stuck out, and that was the STIC11 mutation, or LKB1. And so in the HTG data set, um, this is uh, uh, for the, the FFPE, for the prospect data. Uh, there were 11, uh, stick 11 mutations and 83 uh, wild type uh, that we have data for. And what we see is that NR4A2 and PPARGC1A are strongly associated with the mutation. And we then took that to the TCGA data set where we have significantly more mutants and more wild type. And again, we pull out the same uh, we pull out the same uh, genes, PPR, uh, PPRGC1A and NR4A2, or along with a, uh, a number of other genes. And so that, uh, the, the sequencing data that we used uh, is shown in two publications from earlier this year down below. Now when we look in the cell lines, we essentially see something very similar. Um, we had 16 mutants and 36 wild type, uh, and this is Q and PA expression in the cell lines, so we've shifted from FFPE to the actual cell lines. And we're showing here a number of nuclear receptors and one of the co-regulators, PPARGC1A, again, that's strongly associated with the LKB1 mutation. And then if we look at our lung cancer uh, cell line data set, both by Illumina or RNA-seq, again, we see something very similar, this, this uh, nnr 4 a 2 PPARGC1A and a couple of other nuclear receptors, particularly the NR4 family, are strongly associated 
with these LKB1 mutations. And so this last panel on the left, this table, is showing you uh, uh, sort of an aggregation of a bunch of data sets. And this was from the Journal of Thoracic Oncology, David Carbone's lab. And what we're seeing here, what, what's on the left is essentially a, a, a summary of a number of genes that are associated with LKB1 mutations in these various tissue and cell line data sets. And the similarity uh, in the genes, particularly the PPAR, GC1, and NR4A2, was what we noticed uh, immediately. And so uh, we, we haven't done any real model or mechanistic study yet in the cell lines, but one thing that we became very interested in is the fact that NR4A2 and PPAR, GC1A, are known to interact together. They're known to be involved in transcriptional output, and they're known to be involved in three aspects of LKB1 biology, particularly cell polarity, cell growth, and cell metabolism. And so the fact that QNPA was able to discover this and we were able to validate all this in these various data sets, uh, we were very, very pleased to see. And like I said, we're going to be doing some, some mechanistic study on uh, the involvement of particularly these two genes in LKB1 mutants. And so just to summarize the second part, um, we analyzed QNPA expression data for NRs and COREGs in 227 tumor normal match pairs. Uh, we were surprised to see that a number of these transcription factors were strongly downregulated in the tumor cells compared to the match normal. Uh, Meta-analysis of 20 curated data sets from lung cancer tissues suggests that NRs are actually systematically downregulated in lung cancer. And this might make some sense. Um, I showed you those hallmarks of cancer earlier in the talk, and, and one of the things that, you know, it, once we sort of got our heads around the fact that this downregulation was real, was that it would make sense for a tumor to want to downregulate an environmentally responsive transcription factor. So once we sort of put down our uh, preconceived notions, we, we, we realized that, that this made philosophical sense. So when we make statistical comparison to these 13 other defined transcription factors, we find that NRs are actually uniquely downregulated amongst that group. We see that cisdrome data for one of the downregulated receptors, uh, glucocorticoid receptor, shows that not only is the transcription factor down GR, but their target genes are downregulated as well. So there is a functional outcome to the downregulation of these receptors. Um, when we compare microarray data for NR coreg expression and tumor versus normal from early stage patients, we do see that the downregulation of a predictable set of receptors has, is essentially underway. Um, we did look at methylation in the TCGA data set. It's the only data set we had that data available for. And we do see that the methylation patterns amongst the downregulated receptors is strongly different from, from their normal. And that might be part of the mechanistic reason why the receptors are downregulated. Um, survival analysis of the most significantly downregulated receptors suggests that their expression is most likely lost during progression. And we did see an increased expression of the NR4 family and PPARGC1A associated with, with uh, LKB1 mutations. So I add this one last slide for uh, a specific reason. Um, a lot of the data that you've seen, most of it in fact, was collected on uh, what we call the EDGE system, where this was, a, this was a chemiluminescent system on a plate. But as time has gone on, uh, HCG has evolved with the times and has a brand new platform uh, where they are put RNA-seq on the back of the QNPA assay. And so we took 14 of the prospect uh, samples that uh, had been run on the chemiluminescence plate and ran them with the RNA-seq uh, platform attached. And we just did a simple correlation. As you can see, the correlation for both tumor and normal is about 0.75 between the two systems. So QNPA is really amenable to any platform that we've been able to work with, and we're very pleased with it all. So uh, I'll quickly acknowledge uh, the Minna Lab, Dr. Minna. Uh, Ryan Carstens was a graduate student uh, who worked with me when the project started. He's gone on to get his PhD. Uh, Luke Girard uh, is uh, one of the stats guys here at UT Southwestern. Um, 
and then HTG, uh, Mark Swartz, uh, Philip Chu, I don't believe is there anymore. John Lucky is uh, with us today, John Weinman, BJ Kearns, uh, Hee Hob, and, and uh, Deb Deborah Thompson. And um, our collaborators at MD Anderson, uh, Heidi Erickson, uh, Ignacio Westuba, and Carmen Behrens. And um, one person not on, there, on here today, but really the world's expert on nuclear receptors is uh, David Mangelsdorf, and, and uh, he's one of the people that helped us really get this going and, and was responsible for the grant that paid for all of this. And so this is our funding, um, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kenneth. A reminder to attendees, you may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which usually appears on the right side of your screen. We'll now continue the webinar with John Lucky of HTG Molecular Diagnostics. Please go ahead, John. Thank you, and first off, before I get started in my uh, presentation, I'd like to thank Dr. Huffman for uh, uh, a great summary of the research they've done with the HTG platforms over the years. Uh, it's really exciting to see kind of where it's taken us. Um, a little bit about HTG. We are a platform chemistry and uh, instrumentation company. Um, uh, recently released in the past year our first initial diagnostic products uh, in the European market. Uh, but primarily what I'll speak to you today about is our RUO products, which are uh, they're, they're designed uh, to support uh, uh, research and oncology uh, applications. The workflow of the technology that uh, Dr. Huffman finished describing in our HC technology is uh, quite simple and takes about 36 to 48 hours from beginning to end to execute through the process. It starts with a simple uh, extraction-free preparation of sample lysates, and that's from FFPE, from plasma serum, in the case of microRNA, uh, or Pax gene uh, cell lines uh, as well. We also do run extracted RNA, uh, uh, although we actually prefer to work with the source material uh, to get started. Uh, this goes through a very simple lysis process. It typically takes about a half hour to prepare samples, uh, which then uh, allows them to be loaded into a 96-volt plate and goes straight into our edge seek instrumentation. Uh, this typically runs overnight. Uh, and it's removed to, to, uh, to, take, to, uh, to perform an offline uh, PCR barcoding step, which I'll go into more detail in a subsequent slide. Uh, after that, a quantitation uh, using the typical uh, qPCR methodology is performed, and then next generation sequencing can be performed using the standard workflows of the variety of different sequencers that are available in the market today. Uh, data parsing, uh, even though this is RNA-seq based uh, uh, application, the data parsing is actually quite simple and does not require the uh, large total transcriptome alignments that typically is uh, seen with RNA-seq. We actually reduce this down to about 15 to 30 minutes depending on the uh, computer horsepower that you have behind the assay. The chemistry itself works based upon nucleus protection, as Dr. Huffman alluded to. Uh, generally, what we do is we create a set of nucleus protection probes shown here in orange which are specific to the mRNA targets or the microRNA targets that we wish to measure. Uh, we've cocktailed up to, in our commercial products, almost 2,600 different probes in the same, light, uh, same cocktail, which allows us to test a single sample lysate uh, for a, a very large number of genes. Uh, these, this cocktail probes is then added into the sample lysate, which is, which is performed, um, as Dr. Huffman alluded to, and the RNA is allowed to hybridize to this. We were able to access both uh, soluble RNA as well as uh, RNA that might be cross-linked inside the FFPE, uh, the tissue matrix, allowing us to use a much smaller sample amount than typically uh, seen with other technologies. Uh, on, either, on either end of these probes, uh, protection probe sequences, we have what we refer to as our wings. Uh, these are hybridized in the case of the edge chemistry with the wingman sequences, which allow them to become double-stranded. Those probes which successfully hybridize to RNA are then uh, subjected to nucle uh, one nucleus tr uh, treatment. Uh, S1 nucleus, for those who don't know, is, is a very powerful single-strand specific uh, enzyme which removes all in hybridized probes. So essentially what I've done is I've created a one-to-one -one mirror image of my starting mRNA, uh, and I've done that and, and created a DNA uh, a mirror image of that at a stoichiometric a one-to-one -one ratio. I then removed the targeted RNA, and I placed this into a PCR reaction, which allows me to add adapter and tag sequences which allow me to uh, both utilize multiple, different, uh, multiple potential different sequencing platforms as well as adding the, uh, the uh, specific barcode systems that are needed for those platforms to allow multiplexing of samples as well as genes. Uh, at the end of this PCR process, 
this, uh, this product is then ready to go be quantitated and go straight into the sequencing protocols utilized by the various platforms. Uh, speaking to the platforms, we do support with our RUO products currently both Illumina and ion torrent platforms. Uh, this is just done through use of different uh, sequence-specific adapters. This allows us to leverage the installed instrumentation that you have in your laboratory already, so it minimizes the amount of investment that you need to do to adopt our technology. Uh, we've also provided all the assays that, are, that I'll uh, mention here in the next couple of slides in multiple different kit configurations, allowing them to be uh, used and optimize the sequencing reads that you have available on the various sequencers uh, in the most economic fashion. Uh, we've really, uh, as, as, as Dr. Huffman alluded to, the switch to the next generation sequencer has been a big uh, improvement for us because it allows us to use uh, the very wide dynamic range that's available to really capture the entirety of gene expression uh, variety that occurs within these samples. Uh, this is a busy slide. I won't go into too much detail, but what I uh, want to impress upon you is that across our various assays, and I've selected a few here, uh, we actually support a very large number of different tissue type, uh, sample input types, uh, FFPE, which was the bulk of what Dr. Huffman spoke to, uh, but we also work with patch gene cells and plasma and serum and microRNA assay. Um, I, I know Dr. Huffman uh, showed some information regarding the sample input amount for their assays, and I'll, I'll, I'll remind you that was on the, our previous platform using the plate-based chemiluminescent assays. Our current assays, when we're working at FFPE, we recommend using five microns uh, of a five micron uh, of a five micron. I'm sorry, five millimeter square of a five micron section, uh, which allows us to get optimal results. Although we do test and uh, obtain acceptable results for all of our assays down to 1.5 millimeters square. Uh, just to put this in context, this is quite in line with what we expect to see from a single section of the core needle biopsy, and this is pretty much general across all different FFPE types uh, when we use uh, uh, neutrobuffin formalin. And speaking of the assays that we have available right now, um, our, 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 our kind of our flagship product right now is our HTGSC immuno oncology panel, which has 549 immuno oncology related genes, uh, which really allows to uh, you to observe the immune response to a given uh, to a tumor within the uh, the, uh, the patient. So looking at particular uh, the pills, looking at the per, uh, peripheral blood looking at the actual, uh, you know, who, who's who in the zoo of the uh, immune uh, cells that are actually present within that tumor. The next assay I'll just refer to briefly is our HG path, uh, path assay, which is the profiling uh, addition to, uh, to uh, histopathology assay. Uh, this is based around uh, IHG surrogate genes, and there's 470 of total, uh, which will allow us to actually uh, look and profile in a slightly different way than the IO panel does uh, across uh, different uh, tumors uh, in different tumor types. Our largest assay on the mRNA side right now is the HC Oncology Biomarker Panel, which is, as I alluded to before, almost uh, 2,560 oncology-related genes. Uh, this is more of a systems biology panel and really allows you to uh, interrogate and uh, look in, in detail of the various different pathways inside the tumor. Uh, so anything that might be related to a, a, excuse me, a tyrosine kinase, anything that might be related to the receptors, as Dr. Uh, Huffman is, uh, research has taken them, but also looking at potential resistance mechanisms to these various uh, drugs that are out there as well. Uh, the last assay that I'll refer to is our uh, HDGNC microRNA whole transcriptome assay. Uh, this assay is uh, quite interesting uh, and it's been a, a little bit, so uses a slightly different chemistry uh, for us, but it allows us to look at microRNA expression uh, both in the FFP tissues as well as uh, fr uh, frozen tissue and extracted RNA, but also allows us to use as little as 15 microliters of plasma or serum as a sample type to look at circulating microRNAs. Uh, it's been quite a, a popular application for this assay and allows you to see, uh, you know, what might be going on without taking the traditional tumor biopsy in a, in a uh, circulating fashion. So at this point, I'll hand it back to uh, uh, Ben and allow him to uh, finish the uh, seminar. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Before we enter the Q&A portion of the webinar, we wanted to ask attendees to please take a moment to take our exit survey after the webinar has ended to give us your feedback. We will now enter the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is for Kenneth Huffman. What is the major future clinical practice implication for this research? So, the, in terms of, so I'll, I'll speak only about lung cancer. So, 
a couple of things. One, um, in terms of in terms of uh, so we uh, you know as as the name of our of our cancer center uh, suggests Hammond Center for Therapeutic Oncology. Um, I'm focused not only on the on the expression of these things, but also the the use of of uh, ligands to the nuclear receptors as a therapeutic alternative. So this work, along with uh, a whole other uh, set of experiments involving ligands to these nuclear receptors and how they respond, how cell lines respond to these these ligands, um, is is of interest to us. So we're looking. You know, lung cancer traditionally has not been thought of as a steroid hormone or hormonally driven cancer, but there's some some evidence that we're we're looking at that suggests that you know it may not be a hormonally driven cancer, but we may be able to manipulate uh, lung cancer using these ligands. And so, from the therapeutic standpoint, that's one thing. Um, but also, as I mentioned, mechanistically, uh, we're very interested in the fact that it appears that receptors are being downregulated as as cancer progresses. So it could very well be that the use of um, these in early detection could be important as well. So, I mean, and, and early detection and, and diagnosis and prognosis could be important as well. So, you know, in terms of nuclear receptors and lung cancer, we're really just kind of getting our feet wet and really trying to to, to look at the possibilities of, of um, you know, what these things mean in lung cancer. So it's kind of hard to answer right now, but those are sort of the big ideas we're, we're trying to think about. Thank you. The next question is for both participants. Is HTG Seek a closed system, or can HTG help to develop custom assays for gene signatures for fewer transcripts? Yeah, I, I can answer that one. Uh, so we do uh, have the capability, and, and we do uh, create custom assays for our customers. Uh, generally, what happens is uh, the, the initial work and the general uh, signature creation or the analysis uh, will be performed in one of our larger assays, either the IO, IO assay uh, or the oncology biomarker assay, uh, potentially the PATH assay in the future. Um, but when there is something that is, uh, you know, that looks to uh, be uh, useful there and, and ready to be deployed um, in, in a different setting, we certainly can create the custom assay around that and make that uh, assay. Uh, a little bit more economical to run on the sequencers. Thank you. The next question is for Kenneth. Can QNPA be used to discover new targets like RNA-seq is used? Uh, so I, I, I would say yes. Um, I, I, there, there's – so the whole – I think the, you know, I think the the important thing that we the thing that we learned using QNPA, and the thing that was most important was that you know we can we can essentially, you know, we can get discovery level information from RNA expression by QNPA, and you know FFPE is a very difficult medium to work in, but the truth of the matter is that's the most common archival material available. So the fact that we were able to pull these, you know, this, these um, sort of characteristics of nuclear receptor expression in lung cancer, the, th the fact that we were able to pull these out with QNPA suggests that, you know, discovery level information is available from this assay. So, you know, obviously targets, target discovery using RNA expression comes with its own caveats. But uh, based on our experience, I would say that QNPA uh, could definitely be used to identify, you know, lead candidates and then obviously through validation studies and preclinical work, you know, validate the work itself. So, uh, yeah, I, I think QNPA is perfectly, uh, a perfectly good um, uh, platform to, to observe discovery level, you know, information for sure. Thank you. Next question. Can QNPA be used to detect other types of aberrations, such as 
fusions or insertions? Yeah, I can answer that question. So uh, not mentioned in our uh, the particular uh, presentation is we do have an assay which is uh, currently CEIV marked in uh, Europe which detects ALK rearrangements as well as ROS red in track one and uh, HER2 insertions. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes, we do have the capability of detecting things that are not traditional RNA expression using this assay. Um, I also mentioned that we do have our first uh, kind of exemplar assay out uh, for DNA chemistry allowing us to look at hotspot mutations as well. Uh, more information for, about that assay is available on our website. Thank you. The next question, does the age of the FFPE block impact the results? For example, if the block is several years old. So just uh, with, from our experience, um, the one, the final slide that uh, we showed you today, um, so the samples where we compared the chemiluminescent to the RNA-seq platform, uh, those samples have actually been at HTG for a couple of years, and they had been cut off of blocks a couple of years before that. So from our experience, um, you know, FFP is obviously, you know, a, a kind of a difficult animal, but uh, we've been able to get expression from, uh, in these QNP assays that we've done from blocks, uh, from, you know, from, from samples that are at least five to ten years old. And I'm sure John's probably got a lot more experience than I do on that. He can tell you more. Yeah, so I mean, we, we've anecdotally used samples that were, uh, had been slide mounted for 15 to 20 years without uh, any noticeable effect on that. Um, so I, I would yeah, just echo what Dr. Huffman said. Um, we can use quite old samples without any apparent loss of, uh, of uh, ability to pull uh, usable data out of them. Thank you. The next question, is macro dissection for FFPE always required? Our recommendation is that you, you, you make sure that you put into the assay what you actually want to measure. Um, so if you're dealing with a, a sample that is, uh, you know, highly, with a high amount of tumor without uh, significant, you know, adjacent normal or stromal tissue, and the answer that you want to get is about that tumor, then, then no, I would say not. Um, I think we all know that, you know, that just beyond the heterogeneity of the tumors themselves, the tissues around them will have different expression patterns. Uh, so potentially having uh, adjacent tissue in there, non-tumor non non tissue in there, uh, could potentially change the signal. So in general, we do recommend uh, a, a macro dissection just so that you are, are ensure that you uh, understand what you're looking at and what, the, what you're obtaining the results for. Thank you. The next question, what do you see as the main advantage of using QNPA in the diagnostic or translational setting? Dr. Huffman, would you like to address it and then I can follow up? Um, yeah, so I, I think, like I said, I think for, you know, for, so I'm, you know, uh, from the, from the research clinical from the clinical research side, uh, or research translating into clinical, from that side of it, you know, the thing that we've been most pleased with is the fact that, you know, RNA expression, you know, there's lots of different platforms that do it, and they all do it pretty well out of easy samples like, you know, frozen tissue or cell lines or, or things like that. But I think the thing that we've been most pleased with is the fact that, you know, QNPA has really produced excellent results out of FFPE, and that's, again, you know, for, for those of us who are interested in going back into archival samples and trying to make correlations and, and look at outcomes for various therapies and, and things like that, I think that's the thing that's most important, you know, to us. The, um, you know, formal in, uh, formal in embedding procedures are still pretty much the, the, the common uh, archival technique for, for surgical samples just because it's easy. You don't need minus 80 freezers. You don't need a bunch of other infrastructure to make it work. And so there will continue to be lots and lots of these samples. And our experience with QNPA has, 
you know, has led us to believe that, that this is a, a really robust way to look at, at those samples, and there's going to continue to be lots and lots of them, unfortunately. So for us, I, it's, I think it's a, very, it's a very valuable research tool. Yeah, and I'll just follow up. Um, I obviously, I completely agree with everything about FFP. I think, uh, like it or not, it's, it's probably the, the sample of choice that's going to be in pathology for, for decades to come still. Um, from our standpoint, and, and really how we designed the edge chemistry to work, um, we, we were really targeting needle core biopsy size uh, pieces of material and, and, and single sections of that material because we know from feedback, um, both from, from clinical labs as well as clinical trials that are being run with pharma partners, that uh, the amount of material that's going to be obtained is just, uh, it's going down. Um, the, the needle core biopsy is overtaking the recession whenever possible. Um, and obviously, that's that's to the benefit to the patient. It's it's less expensive to the healthcare providers. Um, so I, I don't think that's a paradigm that's going to change. So being able to work with these small samples is absolutely key. Um, we've also looked at kind of the advantage of, of some of our uh, larger RNA seq competitors. We're significantly faster, both on the amount of time it actually takes to execute the assay, um, as well as the amount of time it takes to analyze the results, and just the sheer amount of, of number crunching that has to occur. Uh, with our assay and, and our data is significantly smaller. Um, I think the third piece that really advantages us in a, uh, in a clinical setting, or a potential clinical setting, would be the cost uh, that's associated with the assay and the fact that we can very economically utilize uh, the sequencing run and uh, really place, in some cases, up to 96 samples in a single uh, sequencing run for analysis. Uh, really allows us to, again, uh, benefit everybody and, and, and really allow the lab to uh, you know, charge, charge the end, uh, customer less money uh, than we are seeing with some of these larger sequencing panels that are out there. Thank you. This concludes the Q&A portion of the webinar. We'd like to thank our presenters today, Kenneth Hoffman from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and John Lucky of HCG Molecular Diagnostics. If we didn't have time to get to your questions, we will try to have them answer directly afterward. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey from the sponsor after you log out. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.